one of the most important things that I ever learned in my accounting days was under promise and over deliver. So set your expectations low for, for this, for this podcast, at least for my end, you're crushing it. What's up, everybody? My name is Mike Whitmire. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Flowcast, also proudly an inactive CPA. Welcome to Blood, Sweat, and Balance Sheets, uh, our podcast where I kind of talk about whatever I want, but we like to focus on accounting, uh, finance, entrepreneurship, and and leadership, and how you can you know kind of progress your career. And that's really a focus of ours. So really excited for today's episode. I think maybe an unexpected guest for for many of you on the line, but really unique and fascinating background. And I'm excited to go through your story. So welcome to the show, uh, Zane. Navratil, Navratil. Close enough. <laughs> hey, it's like Martina Navratilova without the ova. So, um, which, is, yeah. which is a perfect comparison. So, for those of you who like tennis, that's a, that's a tennis reference and plays right back, right into your background. So, thank you so much for joining us today, man. Sorry, I, I messed your name up there, but uh, I'm sure we'll get on a better better track here. Yes, yeah, so I would love to hear a little bit about yourself. Yeah, definitely. Well, you crushed that uh, that intro. Um, I can't promise the same for me. One of the most important things that I ever learned in my accounting days was under promise and over deliver. So set your expectations low for for this for this podcast, at least for my end. You're crushing it, but I agree with that. That's been a, a common business thing for me as well. Yeah, set those low expectations, and people uh, are happy with how you perform from there. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me on the on the show, and I was very very fortunate for for the for the people listening to be able to come over to the Flowcast headquarters and uh, teach a couple people how to how to play some pickleball. So that is that's what I'm doing currently. I'm a professional pickleball player, but uh, I got my start in in accounting. Um, I made it a full 10 months be- with Deloitte before I retired. And now I play and teach pickleball as my full time job. And were you in the uh, were you in the audit practice at Deloitte? I was. Yep. And yep. Where were you located? I was in the Milwaukee office. Milwaukee. Um, okay. So what kind of audits are you doing in Milwaukee? What made you leave after 10 months? <laughs> well, it's a lot of <laughs> manufacturing, um, a lot of manufacturing clients. Um, so what made me leave was pickleball. So essentially, I mean, I, I felt that Deloitte was the best job that I could ask for out of college with an accounting degree. And Basically, right around the time that I had quit my job, it was July of 2020, and um, two professional pickleball tours were, you know, getting uh, getting some steam going behind them, and getting more and more prize money. I was being offered better sponsorships by companies, and pickleball has been the fastest growing sports and sport in the United States for two years in a row, with about 20 percent year over year participation growth. And so I realized that being able to play pickleball professionally was a time sensitive opportunity. I left Deloitte on good terms and I figured, Hey, I might as well give this a shot while I, while I can. So I'm very, very near to being that, uh, that inactive CPA. (laughs) (laughs) So, okay. So it's not that you hated accounting and wanted to get out and said, Hey, I have literally a once in a lifetime opportunity. I need to go take a risk on pickleball and see if it's going to work out. And it makes sense that your bosses would be pretty understanding of that situation. Yeah. I mean, well, there are certain parts of it that I didn't like particularly much. I I worked a lot. You know, I don't like to think that I'm lazy, but there's, there's a line (laughs) for me. So yeah, how do you, uh, how do you practice and, you know, train for pickleball while working those many hours? Well, both things kind of suffered is the thing. So I would attempt to do my pickleball workouts before work. So my client was about 45 minutes away from me each way. So I would wake up at about 4.45, get to the gym by 5.30, play from 5.30 until about 7, take a shower over at the gym and try to get to my client by 8 a.m. And the more I kept doing that, the worse I kept drilling my pickleball game and the worse I kept auditing. So wow. one of those two things needed to, do, uh, needed to change. And so I, I took, the, uh, took the, the quit the job route. Okay, so pick, I'd like to just take a step back and, and talk about pickleball a little bit. This clearly became more popular during COVID. That was really when it got on my radar. And it's it's funny, actually, the guy you know from Flowcast, Mark Craver, was the one who really like 
brought it to me. He picked it up as his, his pandemic hobby, got super into it. Really. He loves it. You know, you look at him today, man, that guy loves pickleball. He plays all the time. Um, and you know, he, he was like, Hey, I, you know, I met this guy, Zane, we started talking and he's an accountant and he's the number one pickleball player in the world. And it's amazing. It's so random. Like we should, you know, we should get you guys hooked up and, and start to work together. But I just could not believe how quickly he got that passionate about pickleball. And it just kind of, for me, like came on the scene out of nowhere. So I don't know. Can you go back in time a little bit? Like what year did you actually start playing pickleball? What was it like? And then you progress towards today, all of a sudden there's a business opportunity where you can start a career around this. So just like, yeah, tell me a little bit more about your experience when you started and how that industry has developed. Yeah, absolutely. So I first picked up a pickleball paddle in 2013. I was okay. a senior in high school and I had a tennis background. So I how'd you get into it? How'd you find out about it? Well, I, so my dad and I played a lot of tennis together and um, he started playing pickleball. And at that point, I was a tennis player and I had preconceived notions of what pickleball was. I had heard of pickleball and I thought that it was a sport for old people. Um, <laughs> is that, the, is that, that the preconceived notion? Yeah, absolutely. That was it. Okay. So that, was, um, that was 2013. And so my dad dragged me over to the Cesar Chavez Center in Racine, Wisconsin and said, you're going to play this with me. And I was like, oh, this is going to be boring. I get there and it's all these guys and ladies that are in like their 60s and 70s. I was like, I told you, dad, I was right. It's all old people. <laughs> He's like, just play, just give it a try. Because he'd been going for two or three weeks at that point. And so I get out there being a two-time state champion at that point in tennis. And I got my butt kicked by these guys named Lyle, Harvey, and Al. And I mean, no offense <laughs> to anybody named Lyle, Harvey, and Al. I'm just going to say... Nobody 26 is named Lyle Harvey or Al. They're great names, but um, these, they were all far older than me and it didn't sit well with me. I'm, I'm athletic. I've got a racket background and yeah. So uh, I kept going back to the Cesar Chavez center until I could beat Lyle Harvey and Al. And I kind of got <laughs> pickleball in the process. Um, I didn't play a tremendous amount of pickleball because I went and played college tennis while okay. getting my accounting degree. Um, but then I started playing a little bit more seriously after I was finishing up my, or after I finished up my accounting degree and my tennis time. And that was summer of 2019 is kind of when I started taking it seriously and getting pretty decent results in pickleball. Okay. And, and where are you living at this point? Right now, I actually just moved from Milwaukee to Austin, Texas about a week ago. Okay. Wow. Big move, man. That's uh, from some cold to some hot. Absolutely. I was just telling, uh, telling the other gentlemen on here that, that we're recording that we never get to 107 degrees in Milwaukee. That's for sure. And uh, people, it's just normal over here, I guess. Yeah. Throw, throw, in the, throw in the 80% humidity and then you really, uh, you yeah, really got it. Uh, so yeah, Austin is very quickly becoming basically like the the hub of pro pickleball. Um, there are a ton of professionals that have moved here from all over the, the country and the headquarters of major league pickleball is down here as well. So it's a good place to be for, for pickleball, just probably not in the middle of July, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it, admittedly maybe the worst month. So things will, things will get better there. Um, so can you tell me a bit about how the business side has evolved here? So you started taking it more seriously in 2019 Fair for me to assume that was when you started entering some tournaments. You probably started winning some things. Actually, can you can you continue with that side of it? Like 2019, you started taking it seriously. So I'd love to hear how that played out. Yeah. So 2019, I started playing some tournaments. I would go somewhere. I'd be super excited because I'd win 75 bucks playing a tournament. I'm like, all right, that's kind of cool. <laughs> and so 20, whatever. Actually, I started 2018, 2019, the same tournaments that I was getting 75 bucks for getting 200 for 2020 obviously we had COVID in the beginning but then two tours emerged and so basically like the trajectory of pickleball is just very very fast growth and so I decided this is just something that I want to be involved in I don't know what I'm going to do in pickleball this is my thought process in 2020 as I'm about to quit my job but I don't know what I want to do on the business side of pickleball I just know that it's something that I want to be involved in because these growth rates are 
un unbelievable for a sport. And so that's just kind of what made me take the leap. Obviously, like, you know, I could sustain my myself by doing private pickleball lessons and whatnot. But what really interested me was being able to scale that and also develop partnerships with with brands and whatnot. Okay. And how, how does a sport take off so much during a time where a lot of people are in quarantine and not going out and doing things with other people? You know, how did two new leagues emerge in the middle of that? Well, so the leagues were kind of emerging at the end of 2019, but then didn't, weren't able to do anything until sort of the second half of 2020. Or, um, so, and how did it grow so quickly? People were purchasing pickleball equipment online and doing it with their family or a couple okay. of and setting up courts in there, kind of like what we did in their parking lot. Right. Yeah. So I came over to, to the Flowcast headquarters and we set up some courts on a temporary net, drew some lines with, with chalk, and we were able to get some good games in, in the parking lot. Right. Yeah. Not ex an expensive hobby. You can probably get enough equipment for four people for a total of 200 bucks. Not bad. So, right? Yeah. That's a very good, very good point. So when you think about, when you think about this sport and it's becoming a bigger business, you fast forward out, let's call it like, 10 or 15 years like where do you see pickleball as a sport well i think there's some de pretty decent traction to getting pickleball to become an olympic sport in 2028 so oh, okay. from what i understand um the host country gets to pick four sort of experiment experimental sports and so Pickleball is pretty big in the Los Angeles area and LA is holding the 28 Olympics. So decent chance that they'll, they'll toss pickleball in there, but who's to say, so I do think, are, are we going to see you on the court in 2028? I would love to. Um, absolutely. But right now the problem is all the best players are from the United States. So there needs to be a little bit more representation from other countries for um, for a, you know, an actual Olympic sport, you know, so think about, it's kind of like basketball where was, yeah. all of the, the best players are playing in the United States. There are very, and at this point, there are very few top, top level professionals playing at, uh, in other countries. So, yeah. And, and in terms of potential, you know, when you look at pickleball, do you think it can become as big as tennis? I actually think it could become bigger than tennis because tennis has such a decent barrier to entry. You need to have lessons for years and years to actually be pretty good at tennis. Mm -hmm. You can be pretty competent at pickleball within a few times of just screwing around with your friends in the backyard. So I think it's actually a better sport for participating. The real hurdle that pickleball needs to climb right now in order to make it a bigger money sport is the viewership. So one of the big strategies in pickleball is hitting soft to the other person's feet. And it does not translate well to TV unless you know what the players are, are doing. So okay. you can, you can understand anybody can watch these quick hands exchanges where people are blasting the ball at each other from 15 feet away and be like, wow, that's pretty cool. Right. But what most people can't understand unless they've played is why is he hitting that ball right to the person five miles per hour? It doesn't make sense to, didn't make sense to me the first time that I saw it, but so the hurdle for pickleball is going to be whether it can eventually translate over to, to TV. I how, how do you get people over that hurdle? How do you get someone excited that a three mile per hour drop shot was just landed and it was like one of the best shots you've ever seen? Um, if you've played it before, like if you, a lot of people understand, maybe understand tennis because they've hit and they realize, oh, wow that's really, really hard to do what they're doing. Um, and maybe people can appreciate th that soft dink shot. That's what they call those soft shots. Okay. Nice. Have, have hit them before. And like, that's not as easy as these guys are, are making it look. So I think that the people participating and understanding how difficult it is makes it, uh, makes it potentially better for viewership. But then also there are other, there are leagues that are experimenting with different formats, different equipment and whatnot that could make the sport more viewer friendly, like major league pickleball. The home is in Austin, Texas, as I mentioned, 
and they are, you know, taking conventional pickleball rules and kind of turning it on its head to make it more viewer friendly. And by all accounts, it is. So interesting. What are, so what are some of those changes? So pickleball has a, a scoring system where you typically only win points on your own serve. Um, but major league pickleball made a f- several different changes. The main one is that you can win points on either team serve. Um, mm. And also what that does is typically it's a big advantage to be the returner of serve. The returner of serve wins a vast majority of the points kind of opposite of tennis where the, in tennis, the server wins the majority of points, but in pickleball, there are a lot of rallies that occur where nobody has won a point. So effectively what rally scoring does is it makes the matches artificially a little bit closer. So there's more sort of crunch time, if you will. Okay. Okay. Well, Hey, if you're going to make changes to the rules early, earlier on in the popularity cycle is the time to do it. Cause then you start to build the purists of the sport and the scoring system and they get upset if you start to change the rules and all that, all that good stuff. So it makes it's sense. A place for experimentation at this point. I mean, yeah. companies are experimenting. Anybody who's making balls are experimenting. I'm experimenting on the, with what works on the business side of things. Nobody yeah. Those right now, right. Nobody knows what's going on with pickleball. It's called the wild west. Um, because everybody's trying something new and doing whatever they think might work. So, well, when, uh, when you were, when you were on site here and hosting the pickleball event, that was a lot of fun. And I noticed, uh, your serve was pretty nasty. And then I heard, are they changing rules because of it or something? Tell me more about that. Yeah. So I guess if there's something that I'm famous for in, in pickleball, it's probably my, my serve. So in pickleball, you have to serve underhanded, but, um, what I started doing was when I'm tossing the ball, I'll toss it with two hands and I'll spin the ball like this as I'm tossing. So what happens is that spin that's from my toss, once it hits my paddle and then hits the ground, it will kick one direction or the other. So a ball that looks like it's going to come right at you will kick four feet to your right. Um, that was tossing it with two hands was banned during in the rules last year. So what I do now is I'll toss the ball with one hand and I'll snap my fingers to generate spin on that ball, um, creating the same effect of making it kick one direction or another. Okay. As of right now, that is, that is legal. Uh, as of January 1st, 2023, who knows? They're gonna. They'll switch to the ping pong where you gotta hold it flat and go up like this. I'll. I'll bet at some at some point. That's what people are, are saying, but that would be unfortunate because a wiffle ball on a on a uh, not textured paddle does not have nearly the same effect as a ping pong ball with a rubbery ping pong paddle. So, yeah, those they're so much tackier. The the ping pong paddles. Nothing absolutely. seems to stick. Okay. So yeah. in well, ping pong you know, spinning the toss would make it almost unreturnable. But in pickleball, I have one of the best serves and people are still returning 90% of my, my serves. Oh, okay. Okay. So it's not, that boggles my mind. Watching you put people to shame out here in the parking lot, I guess is a different thing than, uh, than professional yeah. pickleball players. But <laughs> that's, that's for, for, those, for those who have not seen it, hop on YouTube and check out, check out Zane's serve. It's, it's pretty wild the way it bounces <laughs> at the end there. Uh, the chainsaw serve. You look up pickleball chainsaw serve and that's, that's it. Or pickleball spin serve. Nice. There you go. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's transition to the business side of it. Cause you're, you're definitely trying to be as involved as possible. I know you have a brand going on. So just tell, tell me more about what you have going on the business side. Yeah. So when I, when I quit my job in 2020, what I started doing was private pickleball lessons. Um, fortunately for me, I, I pretty quickly, um, started getting more private lessons than I could deal with. And then I scaled up to, to clinics. So, um, I'll have eight people at a given time that I will, that I'll teach and we will go through skills and whatnot, skills and drills, technique. And I realized that there's not a tremendous amount of people kind of doing this. And there's, there's a decent enough market for, 
for creating a sort of standard um, standard sort of syllabus to teach people based on I, what I think are best practices and, and scale that and do more and more clinics kind of across the, the country. So what I did was I partnered up with the professional tour that I play on called the Association of Pickleball Professionals. And so we created this entity called the APP Academy, where at every APP tournament, you know that you can go get great instruction from myself and a co-instructor following the tournament. That's this year, that's 2022. But then the idea is once we kind of figure out the best way to, to run these clinics, it can be scaled and done across the country with people other than myself, other great professional players and instructors. So that's what I'm currently doing. Um, I, I sit on the, the board of Major League Pickleball as well. So I, uh, I get to look over some financials every now and then. Nice. Uh, yep, are, you, yep. are you the audit chair on the board? I am not. There are, there, are, <laughs> there are more skilled auditors than myself on that board. That's for sure. Uh, yeah, they don't want a washed up, inactive CPA. Maybe not <laughs> active, Mike. Maybe that. No, I'm just kidding. I think the, the secret sauce there is you want the softest audit, uh, audit chair member to just get, get through that thing quickly. <laughs> Maybe. But. Um, but so, again, I still think that not fully sure what the end game is in pickleball. Just I need to be nearby, right? I want to build yeah. a brand and be able to quickly pivot to whatever that next thing is. Now, I don't want to be, you know, like, like a um, – like a dog chasing a squirrel or something for the next, for the very next thing. But I think it's good to be in this industry and good to be able to, to pivot pretty quickly because just in the last couple of years, there've been so many new developments that nobody had foreseen. Yeah. And it's, it feels like with something like this, the needs of the sport are going to change. And you were making the comment that, you know, the more you, the more you play, probably the more likely you are to be interested in watching the tournament, understanding the nuances. And so, yeah, it feels like you helping people learn how to play is probably like the most impactful thing you can do for helping get pickleball off the well, ground. I'd ask you, like, what, to, what what was your experience with our with our event? Now, I know you had played, I, I believe, one or two times before with with Mark. But yeah, I mean, like as a somebody who understands pickleball now and but still a relative pickleball newcomer like what are your thoughts about the about the sport i think you described it really well i mean the the barrier to entry is super low and you can go out there and get competent pretty quickly and watching the way you ran the training i thought it was very very clean like you had clearly done this before you were teaching people in a certain way and they were kind of doing their own thing and learning while you were instructing and everything and so i thought the way you ran the camp was very conductive to like people getting excited about it quickly. You know, you could see people when they got it back over, they, they rallied a little bit. They were getting excited. You could see the adrenaline pumping and high fives and stuff just from starting to get it. And that took like 10 minutes. You know, you get that, you get that positive dopamine hit within 10 minutes. It's going to be more likely that someone's going to be hooked on something. So, uh, I mean, my experience is very similar to what you, you described. I, I have, I've played no tennis in my, well, I played tennis, but I got a busted shoulder. So I don't really play that much, but ping pong's my jam. So I could, I could, carry some of that over, which was, which was helpful, but yeah, fun sport, low barrier to entry and you play with other people. And so it's a, it's a good time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a, yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it. I'm not going back to auditing anytime soon. I don't think that's the, the play. <laughs> <laughs> Makes perfect sense. Well, I mean, between the sport and the business side of it, it sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, most definitely. Can't, I can't, yeah. so I'm going to so appreciate every day of it. No, I'm sure. And we're, um, I want to leave you with, uh, you know, wrap up in one last question here. So our, our audience is generally a lot of accountants, finance folks, people, you know, interested in entrepreneurship. So just as you, as you reflect on what you have going on right now and kind of the future, how has accounting, how has majored in accounting and working in audit for, albeit your short period, but like, how do you think that's helped you with entrepreneurship and, and where you want to take the rest of your career? Yeah, absolutely. Um, a lot of times people will say, oh, you're, you got the accounting degree and now, now you're not using it. Do you regret that? And I have absolutely no regrets whatsoever. I wouldn't change my path at all. I might play a little bit more pickleball when I was uh, maybe five years old instead of starting when I was 17, but I would still get that degree because 
my my degree and my time at Deloitte definitely taught me a couple things. First, even if I work 85 hours this week, it won't be as bad as what I did. So, <laughs> so now I can work 85 and I'll be okay. But it's the um, happiest 85 of your life. <laughs> yeah. So so it, it it taught me how to work work hard and work efficiently, which is something that you have to have as an entrepreneur. A lot of times entrepreneurs, in my opinion, and they work harder, not smarter. And it's easy to get dive into the details where what I'm trying to do for myself is delegate everything that I'm not the best at. So right now I'm a very good pickleball player and instructor, but I'm trying to surround myself with people that are far smarter in other areas than, than myself. So I, I hired an agent, I hired a personal trainer, I hired somebody that helps me out with my marketing. And I hired uh, a teenager that takes all of my YouTube videos and turns them into TikTok and social media content. So, and then I have somebody that runs as pretty much runs all of my, my camps, all the administrative work there. So I learned that, you know, when you have a problem at Deloitte, you call the expert in that, in that area. And there's always some sort of support. You try and figure it out yourself so that you can understand it. And then you get somebody that's better than you. So I learned how to, how to pretty quickly figure out whether I am going to be able to do something effectively and efficiently, or whether I should punt it over to somebody else, which is something that I think a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with. Uh, amen. You're spot on. I'll, I'll say I'm very impressed hearing you say that because it's something I struggled with. I was not good about letting go of details and yeah, realizing they're experts and I can I can hire folks or hand things off. So, oh man, that's that spoke to me personally. That's something I can work on. Hey, okay. I did it. I mean, I did everything in my business for the first six months or so, and so you know, I, I hired an, an assistant and she wasn't doing things exactly the way that I did it. And but then I realized immaterial right yeah um it's still getting done it's immaterial whatever such as life mm -hmm. i think that's a good way to think about it so it sounds like you, you basically thought about like hey what am i not good at let me hire people to do those things and then i've noticed so that's the progression is what am i not good at but then also after that it's what do i not want to do anymore and then that's that's when it's fun right because it's like oh i get to delegate the stuff i just don't want to do anymore do you, do you feel like you're at that phase yet yeah, well, what I'm trying to do is delegate everything that I don't actually have to do, essentially. Because my time as a, you know, LeBron, I'm not, not comparing myself to LeBron, but like the best athletes. You're are, the number one player in the world. It's, it's, it's fair. Mm -hmm. Well, they're not doing anything really other than spending time with their family and perfecting their craft. And so I'm trying to do all of this other stuff. And there's a limited amount of time, like I mentioned for me to play at the highest level. So yeah. I'm trying to teach and play and basically get everything else off of my to-do list that I possibly can. Makes perfect sense, man. I'm, I'm super impressed. And uh, with that, I want to let you get back to, to practicing here and working on your, uh, your pickleball craft. <laughs> hey, well, this is a pleasure. Um, I know when, when Mark reached out, I was, I was very, very excited to, to do some work with Flowcast and it's been, it's been awesome. And it's been a pleasure being on the, on the podcast and telling everybody a little bit about uh, pickleball. So if yeah, you haven't, well, haven't checked it out, you'll have to give it a Google. You can check me out on, on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, basically anything. Um, it's a great place to, to learn a little bit about pickleball. So yeah, check it out. Very, very fun sport. I think it's a, has a really bright future in front of it. And I have a very strong suspicion that you're going to be right at the heart of uh, the future of pickleball. So dude, thank you so much for taking the time. It was really, really informative, really interesting. And it's been great working with you. We, uh, we love the partnership. Have a good rest of your day, Zane. Thanks, man. Take it easy.